My friends, as the title says, we live in shitty times. Our planet, no, it sucks. Our planet is dying, social inequality is rampant, and there's an orange ass clown squatting in our White House. Short, we're, we're all fucked. But no, push that negativity out of your mind and focus on something positive, like a nice warm slice of pizza pie. Uh, the restaurant pictured here is North Korea's newest and trendiest pizza establishment. And if you're a young, hip, happening metropolitan North Korean, this is where you go to after a long day in the office to relax, kick back, enjoy some nice, warm, juicy pizza. All the while knowing that your f millions of your fellow citizens are being starved and tortured. And this could happen to you at any time. The secret police can burst into the pizza parlor, drag you away, screaming in horror before you bite into the pizza. But no, no, forget all that. Focus on the cheesy goodness. Yeah, it's so good. Or if you can't drown out the horror in your mind, you could always put down the slice, go home, pick up a gun, and put a bullet through your head. <laughs> uh, both options seem wrong in their own way. Is there a third path forward where we don't lie to ourselves and don't kill ourselves? Yes. No, yeah, yes, there is, says this man right here. Albert Camus, the Nobel Prize winning author and philosopher whose theory of absurdism I'm going to discuss today. But first, a caveat. Camus had some brilliant ideas, but he is also the quintessential dead white male writer. And over-romanticized tales of his exploits have been uh, used as justification by plenty of young shitheads to drink too much cognac and treat their girlfriends like shit and that is not cool, and I don't want to romanticize that. So I don't want to focus on the dude's biography. I want to focus on his ideas. And all you really need to know about Camus' biography is this. He was born in French Algeria in 1913, where he had kind of a shitty life. And in 1940, in his, mid tw in his late 20s, he shows up in Paris just in time to see these assholes marching down the streets like they own the place, which was bad enough. No, this was bad enough, but what made it even worse was the fact that his fellow French citizens were going about their bourgeois days like everything was okay, everything was all right. Put yourself in Camus' shoes. There are literal Nazis marching down your country's streets, and your fellow countrymen pretend that everything is all right. It's fucked up, and it's absurd. And what's absurd, according to Camus, isn't the Nazi part because we live in a chaotic Nazi-ridden universe. It's the fact that people are pretending everything is okay. Everything is not okay. Not okay, not cool people. And it's this contrast between this meaningless Nazi-ridden nature of existence and the false narratives we tell ourselves that give us this sense of absurdity. Sooner or later, the narratives collapse and we drown in absurdity. And this is an experience we all went through in uh, November of 2016. And <laughs> absurdity is hard to describe. It needs to be experienced to fully understood. And Camus wanted to amplify that experience the only way he knew how. He wrote the shit out of it. Uh, by 1942, he publishes his three great canonical works that he calls his three absurds. A play, a novel, and a book of philosophical essays. And I want to describe these to you now to really get his message across. First, the play. It's all about our good friend, Mad Emperor Caligula. All, <laughs> though, though, in Camus' interpretation, Caligula is far from mad. In some ways, he's the sanest man in Rome. You see, Caligula has glimpsed the empty nature of the universe, and he wishes to share that message with his fellow Romans the only way he knows how, through butchery and degradation. He dresses up as a beautiful goddess Venus and makes his subject worship on their knees to prove to them that there's no such things as goddesses. Basically, uh, Camus Caligula is kind of like our joker. He wants to show that our morals and our codes are all one great joke. And on some deeper level, Camus is asking us to imagine that the joker is running the universe and there's no benevolent Batman that will swoop down and save you no matter how hard you pray. How can you go on in a universe such as this? And more importantly, can you ever be happy in it? Uh, 
Well, well, Camus has a response to that in his uh, most well-read work, the infamous novel, The Stranger. Now, the hero of The Stranger is an alienated 30-year-old French Algerian office worker named Merceau. Marceau spends his day swimming in the sea, coldly fucking his girlfriend, and generally not giving a shit about anything. Halfway through the novel, he randomly shoots an Arab on an isolated beach for no reason other than the sun is shining way too brightly that day. Camus, yeah, it's pretty absurd. Uh, Camus, uh, uh, Marceau's promptly arrested, tried, found guilty, and sentenced to death by guillotine. And this is where Marceau undergoes, completes his transformation from mere anti-hero to what Camus calls an absurd hero. Our absurd hero is in, trapped in his prison cell knowing that he's gonna die. It's a very human condition. We all are going to die. And Marceau, like us, can do shit about it. All that Marceau has at his disposal is his mental faculties, which he tries to leverage. And he does. And in the final paragraph of the novel, something amazing happens. Marceau realizes that he's been happy this whole time. For the first time, the first, I laid my heart open to the gentle indifference of the universe. To feel it so much like myself made me realize that I'd been happy and I was happy still. For all to be accomplished, for me to feel less alone, I had only to wish that on the day of my execution there should be a huge crowd of spectators and that they greet me with howls of hate. Uh, what's in some ways, you know, in some ways, uh, the fact that Marceau is able to find happiness in such decrepit conditions is more shocking than the murder he commits. How is this possible? It is to address this how that Camus writes his great philosophical work, The Myth of Sisyphus. The book begins with a bang, as Camus writes, there is only one really serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. To be or not to be, that is the question. Do we suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or do we go home and snuff it? Uh, for Camus, this is a real serious concern. He believes that some arch armchair philosopher will glimpse the absurdity of existence and realize that life is not worth meaning. And Camus disagrees with this. He's trying to find a flaw in this chain of logic. At the same time, while addressing the uh, physical suicide, Camus is equally concerned with the suicide of the mind. What do I mean by that? Well, suppose you glimpse the universe as it really is. And you go, nope, not having none of that. So you plug yourself into some sort of virtual reality matrix where unicorns fart rainbows and pornography grows on gumdrop trees. But at the same time, you're still in your shitty universe, probably lying in a literal puddle of shit. And even though your heart is beating, uh, the body's pretty much dead for all intents and purposes because it's trapped in your mind, is trapped in this digital cocoon, which should, should sound pretty familiar. Uh, uh, so uh, s a social media is just one way to commit suicide of the mind. You can do it through drinks and drugs and mindless consumerism and according to Camus, false religious beliefs. But what are our alternatives? What do we do if we don't want to commit suicide of the body or the mind? To figure this out, Camus comes up with a, an ingenious thought experiment referencing the ancient myth of Sisyphus. Uh, Sisyphus was a Greek king who, according to lore, was the wisest man of all time, like a thousand times smarter than Einstein. Uh, he uses his intelligence to try and outwit the gods, which really pisses them off. So they drag him down to Hades and punish him in the most cruel way possible. He has to roll a boulder up a hill for all eternity. And, you know, he has no way out. He can't kill himself, right? Because he's already dead in Hades. And like he can't pray to the gods for salvation because the gods are the ones that put them here, put him there. All he has at his disposal is his mental faculties, which he uses. Well, he has to use, but what should he do? What would you do in Sisyphus's place? And I know the techies in the audience are having trouble identifying with an old Greek myth, so I'm going to put it into terms you can understand. Suppose you piss off some all-powerful artificial superintelligence, and it decides.
decides to punish you by cloning a digital copy of your mind, which is going to torture for all eternity. Standard Black Mirror stuff. Uh, and it's going to torture you in a way most befitting a techie. You have to debug crappy code for all time. And the moment, the moment you're about to squash that final bug, 10 more bugs pop in its place. And uh, after like a couple, a thousand years of this, what feels like a couple thousand years, your brain is going to turn to mush. You're going to turn insane into this dribbling catatonic state. And the machines will go, yes, we have broken the fleshling. And the machines win. Do you want the machines to win? Do you want the machines to win? No, fuck the machines. I say rebel the only way you can. The machines want to break you. And you know what would really piss them off? if you pretend to be happy, if you pretend you're actually enjoying coding. Uh, how do you do that? By finding a rhythm, finding a thing, forcing a meeting, finding a way you can enjoy it, clearing away the rhythm, the click clack of the keyboard, and the machines be like, hey, this dude is happy, or this gal is happy, what the fuck? And that pisses them off, and that makes you even more happy, which makes you enjoy it even more. And like that pisses the machines off even more, and you're going, yeah, 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 yeah. And then like this, eternal and the cycle of like coding and joy and yeah 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 it is that struggle it is that struggle that can bring joy into your heart as Camus puts it the struggle itself towards the heights is enough to fill a man's heart one must imagine Sisyphus happy he is happy pushing his boulder as a fuck you to the gods just just like somewhere in North Korea, there's somebody biting into a delicious slice of pizza as a fuck you to Kim Jong-un. And afterwards, they will take their lover by the hand, take him back home for some hot, sweaty North Korean sex as a fuck you to Kim Jong-un. And here I am, standing before you tonight, full of happiness, adrenaline, and joy, as a fuck you to the idiots in power, as a fuck you to the whole Carthus universe, as, as a fuck you. As a fuck you to the fact that one day I will die. One day I will die. But right now I'm alive and I'm happy. As Camus had put it, happiness and the absurd are two sons of the same earth. They are inseparable. I'd like to raise my glass and offer a toast to being happy in these most absurd of times. Cheers. Aw, oh, yeah. I would like to thank you all for coming out, hopefully just a little bit of meaning in the meaningless void. I would also like to tender up a huge thank you to all of our speakers tonight and our amazing volunteers who make everything happen and for our stellar audience patrons and members for making this all happen tonight. Thank you so much. We will not leave you for long. Coming up next in just two weeks, uh, join us for stories of death-defying magicians, a history of blood sports, the, or the sinister origin of insurance, a stunt woman, and uh, what it takes to smelt iron in your own backyard, and how hard mission control works to make everything else work. At risk, October 4th, discounted advance tickets are available at the merch table, and also, ooh, Jaws? <laughs> Okay, um, coming up also uh, October 9th, we have another of the after, uh, after lives session of the Odd Salon New York City chapter. Uh, please tell your New York friends or fly to New York and, and see, see the show there. Road trip. Uh, and again, if you're inspired by tonight's talks, please, uh, please submit pitches for future salons. Join our mailing list. Become a member and support our endeavors. Cool. Membership is really cool. And uh, last but not least, please join our Something Weird group. We will uh, put a ton of additional material and resources from tonight's talks online and continue the conversation there. So again, thank you so much to the SF Public Works for hosting us. Thank you speakers, volunteers, and everyone making it happen. Thank you all for coming and good night. Yeah.